I make a film in much the same way that I work on a drawing or in the same way that I used to paint. And I think for very much the same reason, and that is that a visual language lets me deal with feelings and lets me deal with reactions to situations that I find very hard to deal with in any other way. definitely intended to go to college and to make money and to be uh, more or less obedient. Not more or less, but completely. I mean, the whole idea that you would ever register protest about anything from, you know, the taste of the carrots right on up to the, what the government's doing in Asia was not something that was really encouraged around the house. So I've, I've really swallowed, you know, a lot of my parents' life. And I'm not anywhere near out of the woods with that one. I mean, this is something, I don't know, I guess you spend a lot of time straightening out the difference between who you are and who, uh, who you were trained to be. I left high school wanting to be a car designer. I, I came from a background where I couldn't conceive the idea of being an artist. So eventually I, I started to realize that I had the choice of working out on my own head and my own individual state of being or doing a design thing, and I just got less and less interested in doing that kind of thing and, and uh, uh, found that working as an artist was just infinitely more rewarding, really. So I was, you know, I was starting to play around with sculpture and I was doing some welding. And then I, I took a photography class just out of curiosity. I'd never taken a picture in my life. The guy that was teaching it was just an incredible turn on, really. I mean, he sort of said, uh, you can use this thing to uh, you know, find out things about yourself, you know, and make some kind of statement. Sort of about, right about the same time I started to realize, or maybe maybe a year or two after I started doing stills, I uh, started just imagining uh, movies that could be just sort of extensions of the stills. And then Bob Abel and I got together. We started talking about ideas and uh, decided to do a film together, which initially was going to be a film about industrial design. And at the same time, we were both sort of questioning all this. And by the time we got around to making the film, we didn't want to make that film at all. We started out to just go and, and shoot a film about summer weekend at the beach down at Santa Monica. I don't know, I had, you know, I, I had a lot of feelings about what that activity was, and they, they were, I was sort of really disturbed by, you know, like all these people kind of, um, most of them seemed to be rather uncomfortable. They were, they were uh, too hot for the most part, and they were uh, putting themselves through all these torturous activities and, and trying to do something to their bodies. I, my, you know, my whole feeling about it at the time was sort of really kind of clinically observing it all from the outside and seeing it all as a kind of dynamo of energy. You know, like all these people are putting out all this energy and they're everybody individually. And then if you take all that energy and add it together, you have uh, a sort of whole field of activity, right? And then the merry-go-round sits physically in the middle of this. And inside the tower is this whirling thing, which is sort of like a dynamo. And it, it I kept getting the flash that, that as this thing spun, that it would, in a sense, was generating something, or else maybe it's the other way around, that it's a motor and all this energy is going into it and making it turn. And at this point, then it goes into high con, and the windows become negative, and then, then you start seeing people that are a different kind of people. Life 
would die instantly. Think of that. Live somewhere near the oil fields. And I always used to come out when I was a kid and sit and watch these things work. Not so much watch it as just feel it, listen to it. Because it's like somehow it's a connection between the surface of the earth and, and what's going on way down in the center, and down at the end of where that pipe goes. It's inexorable and it has a force to it. It's, it's just so compelling and incredible. So when I shot the film, I started taking bits and pieces of the motion that it has and, and trying to weld them together into something that was not really an oil well or not really the, the recording of an oil well, but somehow a recapitulation of the, of the kinetic energy and the force that it has. I sort of, for a long time, felt it, that I wanted to make a film. More or less real things in it, a less abstract film than, than the previous one, but using uh, similar techniques and be able to comment somewhat more. In other words, make something that was less pure, but had more uh, subconscious imagery and more, uh, more sort of conflicting stuff in it. Some of the really, really ambivalent, really sort of incredible, absurd things started uh, I thought began to have an importance that I, I could begin to see them fitting into another another film. And so I started I started to sort of like uh, duping and compiling a lot of elements for the first six months or so. There were all things that had a sort of uh, implications about uh, about like dehumanization. Well, at least at first, uh, I looked for things that were kind of. Uh, they're kind of cruel in a way. They're kind of evidences of, of cruelty, or of not not just brute cruelty, but but kind of sort of absurd situations where, where things were going on that uh, 
It had a kind of nightmarish, disturbing quality. The beating heart sitting in the parking lot. Uh, you know, I mean, a heart standing for all kinds of things from I mean, it isn't, it isn't a Valentine heart, but it almost is. Once you recognize it, it's, a, it's kind of a heart. You can sort of see that it has something to do with love. But it's love in a very clinical kind of way. It has this arrow pointing at it. And it's also, uh, it's the life pump. And, uh, and if you have a great huge one that's, that's sitting, you know, in a, in a landscape, then it must be pumping life through the landscape in some way, which is an intriguing idea. You know, if it were to stop, what would happen to all the people that are milling around in the foreground, you know? I, I, you know, I just like to play with ideas like that, you know? And then also, you know, I was getting at ideas of, of like uh, actions that would repeat over and over again. Another rare sight in daylight, a leopard lingering over his night's kill. The vultures waiting for their meal. The presence of the killer makes the jungle uneasy. Growls to warn away the vultures. Baboons barking in alarm start to pour from the trees. recorded the track off of some film on television and there was a it was a chase scene uh, where somebody I don't know somebody slams the door and runs out and says he's dead and somebody else says who is it and somebody says it's Saunders the manager and then this woman says oh I gotta get my slippers and she slams the door and then this other kind of gruff voice says hey lady and I found you know in the movie all of that uh, when I ran the scene I realized that what I wanted to do is to make these people slowly kind of disintegrate and disappear while somebody else on the track is trying to call him to come back. Which is just, I don't know, that was really just kind of a funny nonsense game, it's just something that happened. Which is really, I mean, to be you know, really honest about it, is the way so much of the film happens. And yet, it's very strange. If you, if you really say that, then it's like you don't take filmmaking very seriously in a way, you know. I mean, I, you know, I went through things where I was sort of worried about this is, like, when am I going to start making serious movies, right? And yet, on the other hand, you know, maybe that's really the most serious way to do it. I don't know. I like to just take a camera whenever, you know, whenever I have time and be open to respond to whatever kind of situation I, I, I find myself in. That seems like a way of bringing uh, life back into the, into the process of making movies, of keeping my own life sort of keeping track of it in such a way that, that I can't get too far away from where I really am because, because if, if, you know, if I'm doing it as I go along, then there's a certain, um, I don't know, maybe, you know, a certain necessity to stay honest and to respond to what's actually uh, in front of me at that time. And if I didn't, you know, allow myself the luxury of, of uh, relating to stuff in this way and, and continually cranking cranking out images then I would I'd be uh, I'd be in the dilemma of having to fall back on stuff that that already existed or that I already knew how to do or that I'd already explored um, or upon things that I could plan to do for the future but neither of these really um, really keeps me in touch the, the same way that uh, just running across something in the real world does. And uh, 
so all that stuff that comes out of that process, uh, you know, just kind of becomes, you know, like a file of, uh, of memories or writer's notes or, or, uh, or clay sketches for sculpture or whatever, what have you. It's just, uh, it's just a vast dustbin of goodies which uh, stays around for a while until I can use it. That's more or less the way that Easy Out came about. The first main scene of Easy Out is uh, made up of three main elements. They're put together in a fairly tightly controlled way to present a situation that has really no, uh, no inherent logic other than the fact that the elements seem to work well together in that way. Uh, in the foreground, there's, there's two pictures of the same man. And he's more or less matted out of what's behind him, which is a giant hand wearing an editing glove. And uh, he can't see the hand because it's behind him and he's always looking right at you. But uh, the hand is back there going through a whole series of signals, which are like uh, uh, their deaf mute talk or their mime or their, uh, you know, the gyrations of some giant creature that maybe is just, is just kind of swooped up and is starting to try to communicate or something. Well, what do you, th well, what do you think it would sound like with something high and, uh, in other words, for the hand, for the, for hand, the hand part? The, the whole thing's just sort of mid-range and low, sort of. Right. So would there, there'd be room in there for a sort of squeaky, squawky, kind of like rubbing two balloons together, kind of. You know that sound? I mean, for, oh, is that what you had in mind for the hand? Well, I'm Something just, like that. I don't know, I'm yeah. thinking. I mean, it, to separate the two. Anyway, right behind the hand, then there's there's a, a green meadow, which is oh, flat and right. even, and then right across the top there's a horizon, uh, which has a road in it. The whole thing is kind of a pyramid with something balanced on top of it. Okay, so how does that scene relate to the total concept of the film? Well, it starts, it? To, it starts to set up the idea of levels, like of one thing sitting in front of another thing. I mean, f physical things in this scene, but all the way through the film, it's like uh, you're presented one thing as being real, and then that thing is removed, and something else is real, and then something else replaces that. It's sort of like uh, if you look at something hard enough, you realize that what you at first imagine is not what it really turns out to be. Mm. Uh, it's sort of like the figures in the front are talking, they're unaware of the hand behind, which is, is making some sort of symbol, and then behind that there are people moving a far distance, and then there's the natural setting, which never changes, sort of constant. And, and then the next scene is the one about the postcard. So again, you're dealing with, with levels and yeah. things behind things. Like at first you know that the postcard is unreal because of the dots and the printing. It gets back to a point you begin, it congeals and you think it's real. And then you see another scene creeping in around the edges. And at first you can't tell you know, whether it's another postcard or whether it's live. And then you begin to see things move in that. At the same time, there's ants moving on the surface. Uh, so Is that the surface of the postcard, or? Well, you don't know. It's on like maybe it's the surface of the film. It's 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 uh, separated from both. So you get like one paradox on another on another. They're just sort of an attempt to say, well, the screen is a physical thing. It's a it's a it's a place, just like the. Uh, the street's a place, and like the postcard's a place, and every one of them's been reproduced in one way or another. The screen is something that something could crawl over, and uh, one could put real ants on the screen, or you could put uh, real ants on the lens of the camera, even. But uh, in this case, I, you know, I, I shot them on a piece of glass, and I and I and I added them later. The whole center section, which I've always sort of called an avalanche, because it started out to be an avalanche originally, and its, it's first life was as a part of a scene in a, in a Max Fleischer animated film. 
the way it finally kind of came out was that uh, we're riding along in the car, my wife and I, and she's driving and I'm filming. You, you, you drive along Highway 395 and you go through uh, little low hills where they've cut uh, a sort of ditch for the road to go through. There's a cliff. You drive along and the cliff blocks out your sight. And then uh, all of a sudden you come out of the, out of the little hole you've been in and you, you see a vista of mountains in the distance. And it's, I sort of flashed on this as being a kind of an analogy for suddenly being able to see something else that was there all the time, but it was hidden by the cliff, or it was hidden by the way you think. Anyway, you, you pull out from behind the cliff, you see the mountain, and then the shot repeats. And then all of a sudden the film begins to flare because at the end of the roll, and, uh, the film runs out, literally. Uh, and then as it runs out, a hand pulls away in the same way that you pull your hand away from the lens when you're through running off the leader and you see the scene that was there that you had covered up. And the scene uh, is, the, is the avalanche. Uh, well, I guess what I saw in it was like an extension of, of screen, which was, um, which was made with spray painting film. And in that, the motion is much more minute particles are smaller and it, uh, it sort of resembles video grain uh, and it, it gives you that same kind of door into into perceiving uh, relationships in within the screen entirely uh, you know on your own and there's absolutely nothing there apart from what you make it oh well, there's nothing more fabulous than to sit with your own work Look at it. Oh, there's no experience the equal old to it. There it is again. I mean, it's absolutely fantastic to me, like, to see people that have, uh, have written an article in a magazine, and they'll rush right out, and they'll buy three or four copies of it off the stand, and they'll flip to that section of the magazine, of the article that they wrote, mm -hmm. and look at it, and look at it, and look at it. And you read those out. reviews over and over right. again. Or you'll, or you'll sit up there with the, with the uh, viewer and the rewinds, and you'll just you know, twist that back uh, and forth and look at that image. And the thing that's sure. terrific is I go and I watch I watch him looking at it more than I even oh, watch what's in the viewer. The reflection I watch the, the, coat. the smile on the face, you know, this beaming smile of pleasure back and forth, and I'm standing over him, you know, giggling and patting You're him on the shoulder. <laughs> standing there thinking I'm lonely. <laughs> I stand there going, far out, far out. Actually, the more I think about it, the more I realize that uh, I mean, making art really is no big deal, really. I mean, it's, it's kind of like uh, the easiest and most natural way of getting enjoyment that I can think of. I don't know who it was said it, but it's like next to masturbation, it's about the most enjoyable thing you can do by yourself. And uh, really, I, th I think most artists do it because they just really dig it. If it turns out to be something that other people like, then then it's all the better and it makes you, it makes it possible for you to go on and do it. The thing is that like as an artist, you are able, you have the good fortune to be able to take the things that you fantasize or whatever it is, all, all of that thing that's inside your head, you have the good fortune of being able to take it out and put it someplace and look at it. Which and it's like a, way of a lot of it, it, connections it, with other people. It is. It can be a way of making connections with other people. Ultimately, it probably comes down to being a way of making a connection with yourself. I think you know at this point, since you know, I mean, I'm 33 now, and I've been doing this for a while. It's sort of like really making art has become so much a part of me that I couldn't really think of living any other way. I mean, it's really just that's the way I've come to define my way of living, and. Uh, just really like dessert. Mm -hmm. uh, it seems really that like just about any other creative activity that you finally wind up choosing between working in a situation that is profitable or you work in a situation that's satisfying primarily from a personal standpoint. The thing that every everybody finds out that is in the business of making art or making films as an art form is that you have to have some other way of making a living, and the more ambitious you are, uh, the more time you have to spend working at something else. One thing that a lot of artists do is teach, because uh, one can teach several days a week and still have time free to do the thing that you're involved with doing. To me, it's just it takes a great load off of my mind to realize that money doesn't really have anything to do with it, other than 
you know, obviously if you're using your own money, there's only so much of it and there's some things that you don't try to do. You can't mount a major production on uh, what you can save off of a salary and a job somewhere. But it's never seemed that difficult to me to come up with ideas that were workable by, you know, one person, by myself, or by a couple of people working together with whatever money is around. Um, it, it, it means that uh, I'm somewhat restricted in terms of where I can live. I have to live with his equipment and I have to you know, work out some kind of arrangement where I can use the stuff that I need and have a place to work and so on. But um, ultimately when I start working on it, there's nobody that has to be satisfied by it but me. And, and then if I finally feel satisfied enough with something to finish it, then I kind of send it off into the world and, and, and hope that uh, some people somewhere will look at it and dig it. And uh, this happens sometimes and sometimes it doesn't.